Um, he's a producer and director, and uh, he's, he uh, has produced documentaries worldwide on locations in the United Arab Emirates, Azerbaijan, the Republic of Georgia, Uzbekistan, Russia, Turkey, Bosnia, and China. He recently produced and directed a documentary film chronicling the events of one woman's journey to China during the 1930s and her role in the conflict between the ruling Nationalist Party and the ruling Communists as each struggled to gain control in the midst of Japanese aggression. That film, uh, he teamed with Eric, Professor Eric Heyer of the Political Science Department called Helen Foster Snow, Witness to Revolution. Uh, Billings Lee is also well known for his documentary Immortal Fortress about the Chechen conflict. Um, he was close to the battle for Mazari Sharif and may produce documentary from that experience. He's also one of the only two, one of only two foreigners on hand at the prison revolt that took the life of a CIA agent. Um, Billingsley, uh, according to his biography, is a nomad, sometimes based in Provo, sometimes working in London, uh, working with Verdic, a think tank that he worked with in the Caucasus uh, war zone. It's our great pleasure to introduce Mr. Dodge Billingsley, eyewitness to the war in Afghanistan. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, I don't actually live in Provo anymore. We moved to Salt Lake, so now it's a bit of a commute. But um, anyway, let's get right to the point. I think we only have an hour. This uh, I was going to talk about Afghanistan a bit and hopefully put it in, put the conflict into some sort of context as we approach a possible action in Iraq. Because uh, there's some interesting things about Afghanistan, how we fought the war, uh, and I think it's one of the most interesting aspects of this conflict. I mean, when you count all the troops, there's only about 4,000 combat-ready troops in Afghanistan, and that's the max of never been more than about 4,000 combat-ready, which is pretty interesting when you think about it. In most cases, or for the most part, the war in Afghanistan was won by about 300 special forces and CIA contract troops. So when I say one, Taliban, regime removed and, uh, well, and the new government installed. I mean, there's different definitions of how, I think, w whether you win or lose the war there, which we'll see also in uh, Iraq. Anyhow, I'm going to start by talking about two, two battles that I was in. One was Operation Anaconda. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. It happened in March. Newsweek billed it as the last battle of the war. I'm not sure how it was billed or why it was billed that way. It was, a, it was a pretty significant action for Afghanistan for a number of reasons. One, because it involved conventional forces as well as uh, special forces, and so there was a lot more, well, there was just a little bit more access. As I mentioned, as I mentioned immediate, uh, just a second ago, the, the primary characteristic of the war in Afghanistan was fought by special forces. It's hard to get up close and personal with those guys. My interaction with the special forces was personal. Most of it's not on film. It's not documented. They don't really like to operate that way. And so it's been a hard war to chronicle and success and, you know, it's been hard to measure. Anyway, Anaconda is different, and so I want to go over that a little bit. failure of the Tora Bora campaign when they left the back door open and it felt that most of the uh, people they were after basically took off and went east to Pakistan. So here we go, Operation Anaconda. The executive area intelligence told them or intelligence believed there was a fair amount of Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and whoever. Okay. All right. In this shy Valley, not far from Pakistan. Pakistan's on the other side of the mountain, other side of the mountain here. The plan basically went as this. Conventional forces were going to drop into what was considered the blocking position. 101st Airborne here, 
the 10th Mountain Division in the southern L landing zone. At that time, they were going to drop in first. At the same time, U.S. Special Forces with Afghan forces were going to swing around this mountain range known as the Well from the north and the south and drive the Taliban forces into the blocking positions. At that point, conventional forces were supposed to take prisoners or exterminate or eliminate the uh, Taliban or al-Qaeda personnel in the valley. At the same time, you had Task Force KBAR, which is your coalition special forces, Germans, Norwegians, Spanish, Canadians. Uh, they were all operating in these passes. One, to block people leaving the valley, but two, to block anybody coming in from the Pakistan side to get the drop on the U.S. conventional forces in these hills, in this hillside. The Australian SAS had, uh, were, they were in charge of the southern approaches here in Task Force 64. So you've got Australian coalition, U.S. special forces surrounding the valley, U.S. conventional forces here, and supposedly a bunch of Taliban within the valley itself. March 2nd, the operation, uh, everybody took uh, a bunch of sh uh, six Chinooks that carry 45 soldiers, basically 45 soldiers each, took off three for these blocking positions. Actually, this map is wrong. Heather is in Ginger's spot, Ginger's in Heather's spot. Not that it makes any big difference, but they dropped soldiers here in, a, in blocking position Ginger, and then between Cindy, Cindy and Diane. Everything was okay for about 30 seconds. As soon as the Chinooks left, uh, the, the 10th Mountain Task Force Summit, they were engaged quite heavily with RPGs and small arms fire, 50 caliber disc of fire from the hilltops surrounding them and from intermediate hills here. The brigade commander, Colonel Wozinski, he dropped in two Black Hawk helicopters right here on a little ridge line. He immediately came under fire. In fact, one of the Black Hawks was hit by an RPG, Airburst RPG, as it dropped down, hit him in the belly. No one was seriously hurt. I think the pilot had some shrapnel, no big deal. I mean, no big deal to them. And they dropped the guys and they took off. What commenced was about a 24, about 20 hour firefight with these guys here. They met sporadic fighting here, but this blocking position, Ginger, and the brigade talk became just, it was one, it was just a nightmare. Also, at the same time, as they swung around here, Special Forces guy was killed within the first two minutes. A mortar round dropped, hit him, killed him, and the Afghan uh, soldiers he was with retreated. And so the operation broke down almost immediately. There was no, there was no movement from, from the special forces positions into the valley, which left these guys here, and now all Taliban forces were able to fight the conventional forces from both sides because there was no one here threatening them on the other side. So there were some things I know. Uh, there was a Sergeant Ashline who became sort of famous. He testified before Congress. He was hit by two rounds of Kalashnikov, uh, but the interceptor body armor uh, just they knocked him down, stunned him a little bit. It worked. He got up, and he was okay. That emboldened a lot of the soldiers, apparently, because once they realized that they could take those rounds right to the chest, they got up and ran to new positions. A couple others were hit a little later on in the day with sniper rounds in the chest or in the back plate, but uh, they all lived. And to me, that was the miracle of the operation, that nobody was killed except, I mean, there was a special forces guy here, but this, this position was amazing. And I've got a, a film that was basically, string, I'm going to show you in a few minutes, stringing together the interviews from the Apache pilot who responded to these calls. But close air support in the daylight hours were from the Apache pilot. Uh, it was from the Apaches. That was it. They had um, fast movers overhead about 18,000 feet, F-14s, F-15s. The French were there. Um, as well, and they had B1s and B52s also. But when you had your guys on the ground, you need to close their support. And at this time, the Taliban and U.S. forces were within three, four, sometimes two to even 150 yards apart. They just couldn't drop JDAMs at that level and be sure they weren't going to inflict friendly fire casualties. And so it was fell to the Apaches. Seven Apaches went to battle the first day, only two flew back. Uh, they weren't shot up. But no, remarkably, again, none of them crash landed in the valley. And I'll show you this little film in a little bit. But they were all shot up. I mean, I saw helicopters come back. They had holes through the rotor. I couldn't believe it. I mean, if it's, anybody wants to go to work for Boeing, I believe in the Apache now. I can't believe it. Redundant systems, expensive aircraft, but I can't believe that nothing went down that valley, considering you could see daylight through almost every one of those helicopters that were shot up. One came back no canopy. The front seat was flying in the wind. 
He was shot through the chin. Bullet came off the console, came up, shot through the chin, came out. You know, considered him, you know, he was no, nothing serious. Um, I mean, considering the amount, I looked at the combat camera footage from the Apaches, and you can see it in the flare, the infrared, the, the black and white flare technology, and you can see the RPG plumes just coming, zipping past the helicopters. It was pretty remarkable that no one ever, that no one went down. Uh, this day, in August, the 10th Mountain took 27 casualties out of 82 that dropped in. A number of them were wounded re- two or three times. What happened was that the, the uh, Taliban had sunk their mortar positions, their base plates, in concrete in pre-designated spots all around the valley. And so they were locked on to all these different positions. And so the first systems were incredibly accurate and were knocking or hitting U.S. positions like just hitting the soldiers one after the other. A number of soldiers were injured like three, four times from just recurring mortar, mortar rounds. A <coughs> um, friend of mine, Sergeant Peterson for the 10th Mountain, he's a 120 millimeter mortar uh, man, and he dropped in with partial squad. He had eight men, a partial platoon. He had eight men, one 120 millimeter mortar. It was supposedly the answer to light artillery for this type of operation, and he went through all 50 rounds in about 40 minutes and basically had to fight for the rest of the day with his M4. And he said he went through 16 magazines that day just to stay alive. And, it, and he said, you know, the funny thing is, he goes, I was in the Gulf War and I'd been in Panama and some different places. I've never had to fire my personal weapon just to, just to, just to exist. Usually you're a mortarman, you're back behind the lines a little bit, and they can't get to you. But he said on that day, everybody was infantry, and you're all just like fighting because they had them completely surrounded. Uh, I was on the second half of the first lift. It was scheduled to go out at 9 a.m. These guys landed around 6 a.m., which is another interesting, uh, what's being debated, whether or not it should have been a daylight. The fact is it was a daylight drop. The commander, he just basically said, we believe there was less danger in dropping them at daylight and what we considered were secure landing zones rather than to try to drop them at night and risk a wreck or some sort of crash because this is about 10,000, 9,000 feet. Here, these are about 10, 11. These are about 8, 9, 9 about 9,500 feet right here. So just uh, determined to drop them during the day. We were on the second half of the first lift. We could not even get in. We got off. We were sitting on the tarmac ready to go. I was in the jump seat. We had all the soldiers behind. The intel guy comes up, and he gives us a map, and he basically says, listen, you've got RPGs here. You've got RPGs here. Stay away from this ridge line. Oh, and by the way, Sam was fired at one of the helicopters on the, you know, earlier this morning. And the pilot's going, geez, you know, I mean, should we even go in? It says, there's no way. It's Apaches, and the, oh, and all your Apaches have been shot up. They're all out. He said, well, if the Apaches can't make it, and they're fast, and they only, you know, have a crew of two, and they're a gunship, how can the Chinook make it? And I was sitting in the jump seat going, yeah, no kidding. I mean, how can it make it? And he turned to me, and he said, you know, are you ready for this? And that was the first time, and I thought, that I've ever really been scared, you know? And I just was, no, I'm not ready for this. But, you know, I was in the jump seat. I wasn't going to say, okay, I'm out. You know, and it was also the first time I ever, I mean, that cliche in the movies where they say, you know, you go because the guy next to you goes. I'm like, that was the only reason I stayed in the helicopter. There's no way I want, I mean, he didn't think he was going to make it back, but he had to go. And the idea that he knew he had to go, that he couldn't just say, sorry, I'm not going. I think, well, I don't know, everybody just felt that way. So I just said, oh, man, this is ridiculous. And we just prepared and the rotor spun up and I started thinking about things and we didn't take off. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> There was too much fire. They knew they couldn't get us in, so they called that, that rotation off, that lift off. And so we all, like, breathed a sigh of relief and then, you know, decided that it was, we wanted to get in there. Everybody was kind of complaining in the back. They couldn't go help their friends. So they knew their friends were, you know, having being hit pretty hard here. We tried again at 4 in the afternoon. We could not get in. The helicopter went or, hovered around the outside of the valley. It went back to the FARP, which is a forward air refueling position just outside the valley that was secure got some more fuel, could not. Four-hour trip, we didn't do anything. Came back in the dark. About at dusk is when things started to change. At dusk, the Apaches went off station, and I'll show you the video, and you'll see why. And the AC-130 gunships came in. AC-130 is probably the great equalizer in these types of, types of conflicts. It's a converted cargo plane. It carries nothing but weapons on it. It flows, it flies in a circle in one direction, all the weapons are on one side of the aircraft, and it just hovers, and it can basically take out 
like football fields in a grid. But what the soldiers were doing was pointing their laser sights for the M4, the personal weapon, at Taliban positions where they were getting mortared. All the laser sights that go in there, the AC-130 would fly overhead and just zap one after the other and just eliminate them. And that's when the fire started dying down. They sent in a Black Hawk around 6.30 p.m. to get the first of the wounded out. Fourteen piled onto that Black Hawk. That's a lot of wounded soldiers on a Black Hawk. And even then, it was hit by an, air, an airburst RPG as it took off. And two guys, I guess, hanging out were wounded in the leg again by shrapnel. So it was still not safe. It was amazing that it did not go down. Um, the brigade talk was almost overrun twice. Almost lost the entire command. They don't talk too much about it. I couldn't get anyone to talk on camera about it. But they had all kinds of problems. And the Apache guys who wa were watching the Taliban guys just basically overrun their position. They used an orange VF panel. And uh, basically anything that didn't have glint tape on the helmet or around the panel was just getting zapped. Any figure, any body moving around. You'll see some parts on here. Guys running left to right on the screen. You'll see 30 millimeter. They're taking them out. Um, they, they were extracted basically about midnight, which is about 20 hours after they dropped about midnight to 2 o'clock. That was the end of day one. It did not serve, the plan did not survive first contact, obviously, or it did, depending on how you look at it. We still had troops in these northern positions. There was no one in the south now. This whole offensive had broken down completely. We got in later that night. We dropped into this position here. We did cave reconnaissance into these areas here. We fired a lot of AT-4s. They fired a lot of AT-4s into the cave complexes. Uh, we were sweeping through the ravines. That supposedly, Task Force K-Bar had our backs up on the top. Um, then, we c then we came down and we linked up into a little mud ruin right in here and sat it out for the next couple of days. The first night in, our position where I was, I was with a bunch of MPs, and this was another thing that was, I think, misinterpreted in the press, as they said, soldiers weren't even prepared, they were, you know, they had to use MPs. Again, that takes take us back to the initial plan. They were, they were supposed to be MPs here. Most of the soldiers were outfitted or equipped with the flexi-cuffs. They were almost all hanging from their equipment. The plan was to pick up prisoners. They really wanted prisoners on this. Unfortunately, since it was a whole 12-day operation, they only had two prisoners taken, and they were in pretty bad shape. They surrendered because they I mean, I was, one of them had both legs broken, and I think his collar was broken, and he'd been up in this cave <laughs> firing a disc at us for about three days, four days, and the seventh day just about he had enough, and he was all alone. The other one was, wasn't in much better shape. They just didn't really get any, any prisoner on this operation. Big debate on how many Taliban were killed. Uh, the critics have said this is a complete failure, a waste of munitions. And they only counted about, they only found about 12 bodies. Um, Air Army command staff claimed 1,000 Taliban, 1,000. But here's the deal, too, on that. When I was out there, they were carpet bombing this ridge line and this ridge line. It was like living between two earthquakes. B-52 would roll in about 12, 2,000 J, J dams in a row. B-1 can hold 24. They unload the whole thing. Just boom, 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 all oh, the whole thing just constantly about every five minutes. It was nuts. I don't know what the body's supposed to look like if you do get caught in a barrage like that. I mean, I think you're probably better off sending those guys out to straight DNA samples, frankly. Um, we went to the mud ruins and there was some um, of that kind of damp, uh, debris in this case. Uh, the other aspect, the other aspect of the operation, they were bombing heavily on the other side of the ridge line, which I didn't understand. I mean, we surmised that they were stopping Taliban from coming in this direction, and that's what they said was happening. On the predator screens, they were watching the map on the other side of the mountain and trying to infiltrate into here, way, way more than Task Force K Bar could handle. So what they were doing, they were copy bombing the back side of the ridge line as well. So they were saying about 500 on this side, about 500 on this side. I don't know. I saw probably a dozen, 18 during the whole. I was out seven days. Mm -hmm. from the east. Now, the Pakistan is still another 40 or so miles across this rugged terrain. They were coming from the eastern area. And again, I think this was designed based upon the perceived failures of Tora Bora. So, um, you know, the Taliban, they were pretty gutsy. They were, uh, they were funny. We were sitting in this position here, and they were on this ledge here, and they would come out of their caves, and they would dance around and taunt us and flip us off, and... Uh, 
it was amazing. And I was like, that is so bizarre. And the guy was launched, they, you know, Peterson was sitting there launching mortars. They were also very smart. They knew they had about 30 seconds from when it hit the tube to when it was going to hit them. And they would dance around for 25 seconds out there, then they'd run their cave and boom, 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 you know. And then we'd go, oh, you know, the guys would all high five. We got them, we got them. Thus would say, come out again. Yeah, try it again. You know, and uh, I was really, it was amazing. I thought, this is unbelievable, you know. So this went on for about two hours until they determined that they called in an airstrike. And they got smarter, you know. They called in an airstrike, and they jumped in their cave. The bombs hit. When the bombs hit, they dropped the mortars down the tube. The guys dust settled. They came out about the time the mortar hit them, and it wiped them all out. That's about two hours of being conned. It was, it was very funny. Um, the other aspect of it is Intel assumed or determined there were six mortars in position in the valley. They came across 30 mortars within the first 48 hours. That's why they got hit so hard. The mortars were just killing. I mean, they were just wiping people out. Uh, you probably may have heard of the seven. There was a bunch of rangers and a SEAL got killed on day three. They flew their MH-47, which is a souped-up version for the Special Forces of the Chinook. They flew it into this area here. All their heavy contact was here. Another thing, this is the, the uh, intel. There was an issue they had problems with, with was that they sent troops in a huge lumbering helicopter into these LZs that were still hot. I mean, they were hot LZs. They were not... They assumed that all the Taliban were here. They dropped them basically on top of the cave complexes right here. So... The SEALs came in here, and uh, they took an RPG. They took multiple RPGs right away. MH-47 is a big, you know, it's a stage 47, just with some extra stuff on it. And they took a couple RPGs. They all hit. Just hit the hydraulic line. Hydraulic fluid sealed the whole entire aircraft. The SEAL was at the top. He split all the way down out the ramp and hit the ground, apparently. This is what they said that they saw on the Predator screen. They could see that he was injured. Meanwhile, it was dark. They lost all their inside um, systems, most of the They could not tell. They lost them. They flew to this point here and crash landed right here. They crash landed here. That's when they realized they were missing their seal. The Predator flew back over. Command staff says that they watched the guy get drug off, taken, tortured, and killed. And that got everybody kind of, you know, annoyed. And what they did was then they sent in these... Uh, Another team, another MH-47 with Rangers, mixed group, came in here. They were shot down. And in that engagement there, you lost six. That was a pretty wild story. There was quite a few write-ups on that. Uh, they lost six people there trying to, to get uh, Robert's body out of there. So of all the, the KIAs in this operation, they were all some special forces or Ranger units. Um, the helicopter and co-pilot of the, heli the second MH-47 were shot when they hit the ground, right through the bubble. And uh, that meant the helicopter well, obviously wasn't going anywhere, and the rest were pinned down, and four others were shot while they were waiting until they could get out of there. Again, the CH, uh, AC-130 was tremendous in solving this. And also, AC-130 was used in Kala Jungi at the forces uprising as well. But the AC-130 is uh, it's slow, it's lumbering, it's... Um, they don't ever... I, I don't think U.S. doctrine even allows it. I've never seen one fly during the day. You know, and uh, I haven't heard of one using, being used during daylight operations, so they had to wait till evening. I'm not saying it didn't, but I don't think it did. And um, I think I just want to show you, show you this film. There's a lot of things we could talk about up there. There's a 12 day operation. You know, I talked to the, the command staff still, and they consider this operation was very successful. Operation BOA never materialized. And this is how, the, this is how they're gauging it. To the point of this operation, they found. Oh, okay. To the point of this operation, they found that they were still having large concentrations of Taliban and Al Qaeda together. After this operation, they feel like they've taken away the enemy's ability to mass. The enemy realized they can't mass anymore. This is the lesson. That, this is one of the things they're taking out of this operation. It is true. BOA did not occur because the massing that they saw down in South Central Afghanistan. We were going to go from this mission to the next mission. It just didn't happen until they just all split up into small units. Basically how the Chechens have been fighting for the whole time. They travel in groups of six to 12 at the most and only group together in groups of 20 or 30 or 50 when they need to attack a Russian column or a Russian convoy. And they melt back into small little groups of, you know, half a dozen. 
and they may never even see another group of a half a dozen maybe, or any more soldiers for you know another few months. So it's probably too early to tell on a strategic level whether this operation, how important it was in the overall context of the war, the conflict. Tactically, there's a lot of really interesting things going on. I uh, was at Fort Leavenworth a few weeks ago talking to the General Staff College about this, and all kinds of issues were raised. You're going to hear somebody on the Apache video say we had we were firing a lot of 30 mic mic 30 millimeter out of their you know out of their gun, but we had to conserve it. Why they had to conserve it? Because they use a, what they call the Robinson internal fuel tank. It was a big debate when it was installed, but what it did is it took away your magazine. You used to have I think a thousand rounds, and I could be wrong. Now you have a hundred plus rounds for your 30 millimeter gun. That's only nine trigger pulls, because every time you pull the trigger, ten rounds go out the barrel. Now in the, if you're going to use the Apache for a standoff attack like it was used in the Gulf War, the number, it was, I think the number one tank killer, that's fine. But if you're going to have close engagement and you've got to separate your troops, from, you know, you got to get in close and you've got to use your 30 millimeter gun, nine trigger pulls, it's not enough. And this is what the Apache guys were saying, is that they would run through the 30 millimeter and all their 2.75 millimeter rockets in about four passes. They were actually using $40,000 Hellfires to fire at lone snipers. And you can see it on the thing, taking out lone individuals with a hellfire. It's not terrible, the Israelis do it, you know. But um, this is an interesting conflict. The other issue is the Apaches, and I'm gonna, we'll go right to it. I know I need to get to this film, is that we worry a lot about surface air missile systems, things like this. The countermeasures on the Apaches worked. Sam went up, and you'll, we'll hear talk about it in the, author, in the uh, film. However, all the damage was caused by AAA, which is, you know, um, RPGs and just basic rifle fire. There's no early warning system that can tell you an RPG launch. You'll hear it over and over from the pilots. When I saw the, and I saw the plume of smoke coming toward me, and that's when they knew. And so it was a real down and dirty affair. And, uh, yeah, in fact, let's just go to this tape real quick, because I can just ramble on forever. It's about 17 minutes long. Hopefully it won't be... on an hour night system. We had a total of five airplanes into the fight initially the, uh, the day of the battle. Going ingress, ingressing that morning, we had to go VFR on top of some cloud layers. So that kind of started the day, which is, you know, you can't see the target area. You, you make the decision, okay, you know, we're going to go on top of the clouds and then we'll descend down into the target area. And it just so happened that day that that, that decision paid off. Uh, myself and Captain Herman, who was my front seater, were the lead aircraft into the engagement area. So we were the first airplanes uh, there that day. We arrived on station about 10 minutes prior to H hour, which is the time the, all the uh, air assault was supposed to arrive. We uh, entered the objective area from the south, flew generally over all the LZs that were possible for use that day to take a quick look at all of them, and then continued on through to the north and set in an overwatch position in the north to watch the list come in so we could respond to anything that might happen. And we were to give them the what we call the cherry ice call. Cherry being it's hot, you can't come in, and then we'll take care of that. Or ice being it's clear, come on in and deliver the packs. Uh, on the morning of 2 March, 
uh, it was clear. We called in the uh, Chinook. They came in and they dropped their, their uh, customers off. The uh, infantry, you know, got off the aircraft. Uh, those three CH-47s departed and then another uh, three CH-47s landed in the southern LZs and the infantry got off and they departed. And really at that point nothing had happened at all. Got any rounds off yet, Jackson? Shortly after the Chinooks left, the infantry was moving into their blocking positions on the ground, and we started getting radio calls from some of the soft elements that were operating to the west of the objective area, uh, requesting our fire support. The U.S. forces were coming in from the, the west, and they started taking mortar, and the, the United States Special Forces guys who were with them started calling us for fire support. They gave us a, a grid coordinate of their present location, we uh, left the, our loitering area, went over to where they were on the ground, uh, did a positive identification with them by flying over the top of them. Once we identified our guys who were on the ground, the good guys who were on the ground, we made one pass to identify the mortar position, came back outbound, turned back in a second time, and that's when we actually engaged it. We serviced uh, about eight personnel and a mortar pit on the west side of the whale. We attacked it, broke left, my wingman attacked it, he broke, we took tracer fire, and we made one more pass on that mortar position. And um, it pretty much suppressed that mortar position, killed the eight personnel. About the time we were engaging that was when uh, the team to the south, which was composed of three aircraft, uh, the first aircraft took a significant hit with an RPG. It was still flyable, but it had lost all its weapons capabilities, so it was remaining with its two other sister ships as an observation platform. At that point, uh, GS forces started taking more mortar fire, but they were taking it from the, the very ridge of uh, the whale now. We flew from the southern tip of it to the northern tip of it to find that mortar position. So we dropped down into uh, the valley that we were initially holding, right, right beside uh, ABF number three, and uh, we set up a uh, right-hand racetrack pattern um, attack on this second mortar position. So I rolled in on the first one and I attacked with rockets. I rolled back in and came in hot. Uh, a lot of 30 mic mics, but we had to conserve it. Uh, and fired up what I had left of my rockets. And uh, it looked like we took out the five, the five individuals that were running right to left or north to south. As we finished our second run and we're getting ready to break right, uh, we took an impact from an RPG from the left. And as that rocked and the aircraft was settling down, another round came through the cockpit. Um, I got a Bucks fail light, and because of the Bucks fail light and the rocking of the aircraft, I figured I had some damage. He made a left turn, and we just lost situational awareness with him. As I was moving down towards the south side of the whale to get out of the hot, the hot zone or the combat zone, um, I had to, I couldn't make contact with my wingman or my lead guy because. He had jumped to the other side of the ridge, so line of sight was lost. It was a little bit of panic, to be perfectly honest with you, at that point, because I had no idea where my wingman was, and I know he had been shot. Radios were pretty hectic. We were talking, our team talking to two different elements on the ground, as well as the team of three in the south that was talking to elements in the south. The terrain blocked some of the radio transmissions because of the high terrain, but sometimes there was bleed over, so you're hearing both ends of the battle going on at once. It took us a couple minutes to, to sort that out, exactly where they were. And obviously we were trying to get his location so we could help him in case he ended up, uh, that airframe ended up going down, which it did not. The aircraft in my team that was damaged was going to return to the refuel and rearming point. And uh, we decided that the aircraft that was damaged in the south would link up with it and they would go as a flight of two. Which we have two airplanes in the south and now we were in the north by ourselves at that point. So we were a single ship up there which ideally no attack guy wants to be single ship. He wants a wingman with him in case, I mean, if we had been shot down, there would have been absolutely nothing that could have supported us that day. After our wingman left, we uh, were in radio contact intermittently with the team in the south. They were still engaging quite a few targets for the, uh, the friendly forces on the ground, and we started getting calls for fire for the infantry in the north. And they were taking fire literally from the east of them, they were taking fire from the west of them from both hills that they were in this little valley. At that time, they were pinned down in a uh, little mud ruins area. They had moved into that position, and they were taking a sporadic small arms fire from a small plateau. So again, we did the same battle handover. They gave us their friendly position. We flew over them, 
the positively identify where the friendly troops were, and then he gave us a direction and distance to where the, the enemy fire was coming from. One of our biggest fears, obviously, is, is killing one of our own guys. And we, we, we had to work hard to make sure that didn't happen. And we were pretty fortunate that day that, that we didn't have any kind of fratricide incidents. We uh, went in and engaged the enemy soldiers we saw on that plateau and did two or three passes. They scattered, and then it took us a while to find the last one and finish the engagement up. And we just kept working with Raider 6, and any time he would take fire from various directions, he would call us in and we'd try to move and see if we could find anything in that area or at least lay down suppressive rounds to, to draw the fire away from the, the infantry on the ground towards us until we could engage the target. Uh, the team that was into the south of us um, took some more damage. They are at their bingo fuel, which means they have the minimum fuel required basically to get back to uh, our park. So they were egressing, which only left us on station. So at that point, we ended up linking back up with that team and uh, going back to the park to refuel and rearm. We were supposed to have station airplanes that day, and one of ours uh, met us at the park. My 30 millimeter gun was leaking hydraulic fluid. So they took off as a flight of five, and I stayed behind while maintenance fixed the hy hydraulic leak on my gun. And once my gun was fixed, I flew to the park and waited. And all of a sudden, we started hearing of the radio traffic of the five airplanes coming back. Of course, all five were all shot up. Um, there was only one capable at that point to go back into action. And when he met us at the park, uh, we got refueled, reloaded with ammunition, and we linked up with that other airplane. And now we became a team, and we were back into the fight again. So on the way there, I'm talking on the radio with Mr. Chenault. I want to know what the deal was. I mean, you know, you come back with five shot-up airplanes. I'm thinking, this is going to be interesting. We're going back with two more. And uh, he basically said, hey, um, all the uh, all the stuff that, that you've been taught as far as hovering, fire, and all that stuff's not going to work there. He says, if you hover, you're going to die. So you need to move and shoot. The fight was so close and so quick that our front seaters really did not get to do a lot of shooting. Uh, the back seaters did predominantly all the shooting. Captain Herman, who was the uh, front seat for flight lead, did get to get a hellfire off, but the battle was so fast, so close, and so intense that uh, front seaters predominantly were given target handovers to their back seaters, keeping their head in the game so they could direct us on where to go and then where to shoot. I had never shot what they call an I had rocket from the back seat. Normally, it's, it's a crew coordination maneuver between the front seat and the back seat when you shoot rockets. That's the way we've always trained. So there wasn't going to be enough time for that. The situation dictated, since we couldn't hover and we couldn't position ourselves anywhere for any kind of standoff, that we weren't going to be able to, to do that. So the back seaters were shooting the rockets. The back seaters primarily the, uh, the, the flyer. Uh, he flies the aircraft, and he gets it into what we call constraints to utilize the weapon system. The front seater is also a pilot. He has controls, but he's primarily considered the co-pilot gunner. The front seater will go through a, a little acronym to where he uh, can scan. He gets some things on. He gets his weapon systems up, and he starts acquiring targets. And then, depending on the target, will we'll dictate how we employ what weapon system. So it's a very deliberate, very methodical kind of fight, which Anaconda was not. I figured on the way there, I, mean, I better practice this. I mean, I've never done it before. So I, I, I was wazzing, wazzing up rockets in the back seat and uh, for some reason wasn't getting a steering cursor at that point. And uh, after a few tries, I said, hey, well, let me just pull the trigger and see what happens. Well, when I shot the rocket, it went fairly low because I wasn't smart enough at that point to look out and see if my rockets were pointed down because, like I said, um, the rocket hit low, the body of the rocket flew up over the top of the helicopter. So I'm going to shot myself down in route. As soon as we got on station, Rock 6, who was the, uh, the third brigade task force commander, was uh, sitting on a uh, ridge line, part of his staff that was with him, and they were taking some pretty heavy machine gun fire. First thing we ended up doing was we ended up uh, identifying their location. So whoever flew their location wants to identify them, we saw the VS-17 panels, which are an, an orange panel that they use during the daytime to signify that, you know, that's them. So we ID'd them on the ground, and we took their target handover. And that's when we went in pretty much and uh, and terminated the, the enemy there. I, I can remember coming over the ridge line. Rich, Rich was working one side of the ridge line, I was working the other side. And I, I remember coming over, 
looking over my shoulder as I come over the ridge line, and I saw a puff of smoke, which is, is you know, synonymous with RPG launch from the side of the ridge line, you know, just below where they were, they, they were supposedly taking fire. And then that's when I, I almost came back to a hover, or turned around, and I just fired that whole side up with uh, 30 millimeter. I mean, my aircraft and our wingman made about seven turns on the guy that was attacking them. I don't know how effective we were there as far as killing those personnel. I think we were pretty effective to the point that we suppressed them because the didn't take any more fire after that. But I actually never saw us actually kill anybody up there. The traffic on the radio was was tremendous as far as everybody wanting fire missions, and and it was hard to it was hard to get a hold of and, and determine where the enemy was. And as soon as we were done with that, uh, Summit 55, uh, they were pinned down pretty bad uh, in what became known as Ginger Valley, and. Um, so we ended up making five passes there, and uh, we drew a lot of fire away from those guys. We took a tremendous amount of RPGs in that, uh, that Ginger Valley. One pass we made there, literally, we saw five RPGs exploding in the scene of our airframe. The way the whole objective was situated, I mean, it was difficult for us to get in there and fight because there was no standoff. So we were going toe to toe with the enemy. And, and at that point, once we flew over, everybody shifted their fire towards us. I ended up with seven holes in the helicopter. and and multiple RPG shot at me. They had us dead to rice, really. The, the Ginger Valley, really rugged terrain, mountains on both sides of us, and it was only about a kilometer wide. So really, anywhere you were in that little canyon, basically, you know, small arms was effective against you, and so was RPGs. So every time we flew over these guys' position, the rest of the Al-Qaeda and Taliban guys that were actually in these mountains were just absolutely trying to kill us, obviously. We ended up taking taking quite a few shots, and. And we were actually, I mean, extremely lucky when we didn't get hit by an RPG. And in our fifth turn, we took some pretty heavy uh, fire to the right side of our airframe. And uh, when that happened, we lost our both night system capabilities, and my front seater lost all targeting whatsoever. We let Rock 6 know that we had yet another damaged airplane, um, so he ended up having us depart station as a team then, and we went back to the far to rearm, refuel again, and determine what we could do. That day they had one more set of lifts coming in. It was supposed to be coming in right before sunset. About a half hour before the, the third lift was supposed to go in there, we ended up departing the park as a team of three, and we got back on station for the third time that day. My crew was actually alerted to Kandahar, and we flew up to help support the mission. For the first pass that when I went through, I could see my lead aircraft took several RPGs that landed either below it or between myself and the lead aircraft. You, know, you could see them explode on the ground or see a white uh, plume of smoke where they had come from. It seemed like every time we got up there, these guys were more prepared for the Apaches. They were more prepared to mass fire on, on anything that was flying, basically. One of the problems we had with uh, with Summit 6 was when we were in there, it was late late in the afternoon, and the sun was right in our eyes, and the one ridge line he was getting hammered from, we couldn't, I mean, we could not see it. it was, I, you know, I know he was... He wasn't happy because he was taking he was taking some heavy fire and, and, and there was really nothing we could do for him. We just could not see anything whatsoever, and we were just getting just abused with small arms and RPGs. Uh, I watched the aircraft in front of me have several RPGs shot at it, uh, two missed low and then one to the aft of it, and then I saw two uh, individuals stand up and launch two RPGs at us. They were only about 10 feet apart and about 300 meters in front of us. I was lucky enough to avoid the two RPGs, uh, break from the heading I was on, and then. Uh, took numerous small arms fire. Right after that happened, I had some triple A come out my left door, and it was so large that even it, though it was not tracers, I could see it. The actual bullets going out my left door. That was the point where, I mean, there was multiple RPG launches, plus Rick said that they launched an SA-7 at my aircraft. He said it went up and around the tail and it hit the ground. I saw the launch of the SA-7. I saw the guy on the ground. I ended up uh, suppressing the guy who was on the ground taking and killing him. And uh, 
we just could not get back in Ginger Valley. So the decision was made by Rock 6 that we just weren't going to go back in there with CH-47s that day. But then after we, we made that pass, it was getting dark and, and Rich had, um, had his night system taken out. So he had no way to fly back at night. And one of the aircraft that was with me didn't have any night system capabilities. So he stayed as long as he could and then we came back as a team. What he ended up doing is using goggles in the back seat to get back at night, which in the mountains with, with limited loom is, is a real chore. I pretty much had to follow my two wingmen back home um, without the, the pads and timbers. I crossed the mountain at 10,500 feet that night and I could not see a thing other than uh, the light from my wingman, really. And that was the, the last time the Apache went in that night. I was that one. From listening to the Apache Pod talk about that day, uh, there's, it was amazing also talking to the guys in the past uh, it, here in Block of Position Ginger. Like I mentioned, though, however, but you know what, let me just, is there any questions or comments? I know people have to go. And so we didn't really get to anything else. We didn't talk about college junkie at all or any sort of relationship between this conflict and Iraq, or is there one, you know, and uh, will it happen, but, Paul? But the, the Russians were in there for years, and had a lot of trouble. What kind of feedback, what the Russians saying about what we were doing, and the way we were doing it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've heard bits and pieces. Uh, you know, I do know that a lot of the uh, acquaintances and friends I have in the military like a lot of the staff at the Foreign Military Studies Office at Fort Leavenworth, they actually, once at, after September 11th, they were all on the plane to Russia. And they were actually out there interviewing Afghan veterans, Russian Afghan veterans, to understand what the Russians went through. I think although it's been studied quite a lot, they, uh, they wanted to make sure and go over this again. Interestingly enough about this valley, it was supposedly the Russians had tried to take and occupy this valley numerous times during their conflict and were never able to which is another kind of, you know, in modern conflict, is, is location that important? In some cases, it's just about morale. This was considered always a strong point. Russians could never take it. Again, the U.S., the military command felt pretty good that they could take and hold this. However, then it reverts back to a guerrilla-type style campaign. How important is it to take and hold this? We gave it up after 12 days, well, 18 days. We came in. After 12 days, the Canadians then did what they called Operation Harpoon, the whale, get it, you know, pretty interesting. And they were there for six days. Uh, getting back to your question, I don't know for sure what the Russians feel about, but I do know that there's been a lot of consulting on that. You know, that we went and asked the Russians a lot of questions. That I know. I don't know. We did it a little differently, obviously, than the mechanized attack that the Russians tried to do. Because the Russians, I know, came in and there's, a lot of uh, burned out BMPs, old T-60, T-7 series tanks along these routes coming into the, the valley, traditional way into the valley. The other thing is, you know, that there was always this fear in Afghanistan that, that we'd lose a lot of air assets by Singer and other SAM uh, man pad systems, surface air missiles, things like that. It just hasn't happened. The one, there's two SAMs fired on D-Day and the uh, countermeasures on the Apache definitely worked against that. Again, what really hurt the Apaches were the uh, RPGs, things like that. So, yes. Military censorship? Okay, it's really funny to, to work with the military. It's really interesting. It's a love-hate relationship, and it basically goes down, in my experience, to personal trust between commanders and people that they've worked with. And that sounds really dumb because it means there's no general solution to the problem of working with the military. But here's the problem, the initial problem. If you're, well, by the time you go to war, it's a grave enough concern. Maybe you agree that it's a security issue or not, but by the time the soldiers are put on the ground or put in harm's way, all of a sudden that space becomes a battle space. And in theory, the, the commander has control of the battle space. 
he has to do that. And in any sort of other business er arenas, you know, the head of the CEO, the CEO would be in charge of his domain. When you go to war, you put a commander in charge of a battle space. He rightly thinks he's in charge of this. What a lot I have found is that then you have a freelance camera guy come stumbling in or walking in like, hey, what's up? You know, and hopefully he's not saying what's up because if he is, they usually just put the flexi cuff on him. And, no, not really. But I mean, you know, he's got, what I found is that the Tenth Mountain, they hate the media, all media. Uh, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel of Camera felt like he'd been burned in the past. He just was not friendly. Uh, 101st, the Rockathons, they were actually pretty good. I had a friend in the 101st, and that's how I got embedded on this mission uh, on, on day one. And at the time, the other aspect of this mission, there were only four of us that were considered non, you know, like to media, or we, the four of us didn't carry a gun on D Day. But if you have to remember, by March, the war kind of petered out. Nothing was happening. All the media tents were empty at all the bases. So I got a call. I came in. I flew to Kuwait. Got picked up by the mil you know, took the military airlift into Bagram. And there was only four of us. By the time I came back in the field after my first six days out in the field, there was about 60 media at the base. They had all come from Kabul and from Uzbekistan, place like that. That was a th It was very interesting. Some of the media were very good, like Dave Moniz from USA Today. Whether you like his columns or not, he's a military uh, specialist for USA Today. He knows how to work with the military. He knows how to work with commanders. He has friends who are commanders. And so I think the most censorship that's going on out there is self-censorship. And what I mean by that is I was invited to the brigade talk every night. I knew everything that was going to happen for the next 24 hours. I was more interested in being out in the field if I, you know, I mean, and I don't, I didn't, you know, and my trust became, for me it was an issue of trust between the EXO, who was a friend of mine, and myself. I was not going to give away the game the night before. I wouldn't do that anyway, you know. Um, so was I censoring myself? Of course I censoring myself. But on the other hand, what did I really want to get? I wanted to get soldier stories. I wanted to get how the operation unfolds. It wasn't even in my interest to say, well, this is what's going to happen tomorrow at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., you know, but I just, so there's that kind of censorship going on. It's kind of a hit or miss. There was a woman who showed up from the Washington Times. She was great. She came in and she had a skirt on, no offense, the women's skirt, but it is a, a military operation, and she uh, said, I need some boots and some military clothes and a, a sleeping bag. And I get altitude sickness, so I need somebody to go with me in case I get sick out there. And the, the public affairs officer said, listen, lady, this is not a tour, guys. This is not a tour. There's a battle going on in this valley, and it's in 9,500 feet. If you get air sickness, you're off the list. And so then she was a, a bit put, you know, put out by that. But other people showed up with a sleeping bag and the gear, and uh, they could hitch a ride. After, like, day four, day five, about day six, they were shuttling people out on almost every helicopter they could. Um... So it was hit or miss. I mean, I saw some, you know, some were happy. It's, it's, that's a tough question. Military and media. Yeah. What are the advantages and disadvantages to this strategic operation and having you present? That's a really good question. Uh, well, I know from a unit level, maybe this is, I don't know if this is considered tactical or strategic. When I came back, a front bunch of the people I know in the tent were kind of annoyed that they had nothing on the tent, that everything I did was about the 101st. And I said, you've got to go talk to the camera because I had no access to the tent. So almost all my stuff was, I mean, the package was 101st. And so they were much more agreeable to having me there, so I stayed with the 101st. I was with the tent for two days and basically got kicked out of their camp and uh, walked back to the 101st position. So but strategically, you want your story told at one point. At some, so that you definitely want. Um, I think it also behooves the military to have independent sources. You don't want everything coming out of the, every bit of news coming directly out of the Pentagon, because then it looks suspect. Whether it's not, is it, you know, that's for you to determine. But you just need other sources, I, I think. And a lot of the military people in the military are just believe that 100 percent, and that's why they do. I mean, there's certain commanders who call up their friends and like who are writers or whoever and they say we've got something going on like I got the call to come to Kuwait they wouldn't tell me what it was they just said you'll like it be there and it turned out to be this so you know it behooves them to do that I mean you saw I don't know if anybody saw We Were Soldiers it was about Joe Galloway and uh, what's that commander's name I don't know huh I can't remember the 
Al Moore, yeah. You know, I mean, that was, they've been lifelong friends since then, apparently, you know, and that was just one of those bizarre situations. He, but he, and he, a bond developed, maybe is in combat, under combat, I don't know, but that turned out to be a good relationship probably for both of them. Um, and some interesting stories. I, I, strategically and tactically, I don't, you know, I'm probably talking around your question, so I'm not sure if I'm answering it or not. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I don't know. You know, I think that, uh, I don't know. I can't see there's a direct, like, terrorist link. I mean, there's a lot of other places to go. I think that Iraq's just on, been on the agenda for a while. I don't think there's a direct relationship at all. That's my personal opinion for, based on what I understand and what I know about the situation. Um, I also think that it's going to be an interesting it's going to be interesting to see how they fight the war in Iraq. You know, now they're saying that, you know, and I, thought, cause I thought it was interesting how they fought the war in Afghanistan. There was just one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about that we got off, I got off side track a bit. I just don't see, maybe it's time to sort of clean house on all the enemies, old enemies, and maybe I, maybe I shouldn't say it so haphazardly, but I, I don't see a direct relationship at all. I don't think it wasn't the mass destruction of our terrorist, you know, a vehicle for terrorism, which it is, so there are lots of reasons to go perhaps and go in and do that. But what's frightening about this idea of Iraq is we're basically talking about going in and replacing the government, which is something we, I mean, we've done it in the past, but this is so blatant that it, uh, it's just a different thing, I think, for America, for the U.S. to get into a little bit. Well, <laughs> I, uh, well, I just got married. We'll see if she survives Iraq. No, she will. <laughs> she will. Um, no, I, you know, I met her because of Afghanistan. I mean, we met looking at some of the footage and she saw some of it. And so we met and last year. And I don't know. You know, it, it can be tough. I, the biggest thing is you can't go for, I like to go for two months at a time, two months at a time. I can't do that anymore. Maybe three weeks is about the most. And I haven't even tested that yet. So probably you're gonna stay in Kuwait while I'm in Iraq, I'm not sure. So if I can get in and out then I, I we're working on that. I don't know. Uh to work with the military? Okay, one thing about this is I usually travel usually I work alone. I don't even I usually don't work for the military. Like I've been in the steps in all these different places, I usually travel independently and link up with the group there. Very happy to travel with the US military. It's really fun for me. Um you sign a general Waiver that says you won't carry a personal firearm. There's just basic rules, you know, that, you, that I, they make everybody sign. I can't remember. It was two pages long. I honestly didn't even read it. <laughs> I skimmed to the first line or two, and I just thought, oh, man. It, you know, I didn't read it. Um, as far as on the operation, for instance, you, you might probably know this by now. The U.S. is really weird about showing dead and wounded. Um, so the one thing we were asked to that we were censored on, back to your question, was pr were prisoners and dead and wounded Americans. They did not want us filming any, US, any prisoners at all, which I don't know why. So when the two came into camp, you know, I just pulled, pushed, you know, just flung the camera over my shoulder. I watched the prisoners being handed off, taken to the black, you know, but I didn't film it. The other uh, was dead or wounded Americans, and they're really sensitive about that, which is still probably a ghost from Vietnam, I don't know. That was the only thing. Oh, yeah, and more recently from mine, probably. Yeah. Oh, Paul. In ginger, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I talked to the S2, the intelligence officer. Uh, he's pretty, he's a funny guy, and uh, we talked quite a lot during the operation, and he had, he, I don't know. Obviously, he wasn't going to say he failed. I don't know if he failed or how much he failed. I mean, in my opinion, nothing happens in Afghanistan without the, the, the enemy knowing this. Knowing. I mean, if you go to Bagram Air Base, there's 500 Afghans that live on the base, local. So, to me, it's a complete intelligence nightmare if I was the S2 trying to keep anything secret. When they were moving troops from Kandahar to Bagram to mount up for this, I mean, all you need is tail spotter to sit outside the base and count transport planes and um, 
you know, they were moving the Apaches and the Chinooks up. There was a lot of things indicating that something was going to happen. I don't know, and the other thing is you had a lot of Zia's forces. We were trying, one of the biggest things about Afghanistan, which is something that will tie in directly to Iraq, is that you're going to try to find Iraqis that we can work with. We took, you know, and the whole thing about Afghanistan, I mean, it's the same exact thing. They were very, the reason I didn't like the military press conference about this operation because they kept saying things like, but the Iraq, but the, uh, but the Afghans were there to be with us. The Afghans were not there. They totally ran away. And I saw them come to the Spanish hospital, the Spanish hospital at Bagram that treats all the uh, Afghan soldiers. None of them were wounded. They came in holding their stomachs and holding their, you know, I talked to the doctors. They said, these guys just want us out of that fight. They take their injuries and they just came into the base. But the whole point is we're trying to prop up the Afghan government because we want a strong, stable government there and we're trying to, like, not produce any bad press on them. This will happen in Iraq if we're trying to figure out who's going to replace Saddam. I mean, I think one of the reasons is it's been such a problem in Iraq is what do you do there? If you do eliminate them, do you throw in a MacArthur-type style government that they've, I've even heard mentioned, like post-World War II Japan? Or do you just let it fall to some sort of international monitoring? Or I mean, what do you do if you do go in and eliminate what you consider to be the threat? So, I don't know. It's kind of strange. I'm pessimistic about it, actually. Um, you know, General Dostum is in the north. He's got an iron grip on the northern part, north-central Afghanistan. He's an Uzbek. He doesn't seem to care too You know, I mean, he tolerates Karzai's government, but if Karzai decides to move in, and I think if there's any authority in the Mazar Sharif area, I think it'll, I think it'll go right to war. We already see General Dostum and his counterpart in the area, the Tajik commander, Osset Atta, they were duking it out last week, or two weeks ago, 23 were killed in fighting between the two factions in, you know, like street battles. I'm not too optimistic about it, not in the short term. But I don't know if the international community has the same power to be there for the long term, so I'm not optimistic about that either. They find, what I've read is that they've been able to recruit, and then as soon as they go through what I guess their basic training, they have a super high desertion rate, <laughs> and they take off into their training and their new uniform and some weapons, and go back to the clan or group or mafia or private army they were with in the first place. That they have, that they've been really suffering because I think they, they have, I don't know what the numbers are. But I've heard things like 30 to 40 percent desert within the first six weeks of being out, and they're just gone. But they definitely want the training, so they're having no problem getting guys to come in and train with the new Afghan army, but they just can't keep them around. It's a different, you know, a different mentality. I'm not saying which is better, the Western mentality or if you want to call it the Eastern mentality, but it's just a different. Even the way the Afghanis fight is different. You know, you see this, that there's, you know, I was there the first seven weeks. I could not get to a battle. I mean, they were surrendering and working deals faster than you could even catch up to the flow. And... I met numerous Northern Alliance commanders who were Taliban last week. It just switched hats, you know, and that's it. And uh, and the Northern Alliance were completely happy. The only to, to like welcome them back into the fold. I mean, the line is shifting back and forth. The only difference were was uh, the foreign Taliban, the foreign fighters, which the Afghanis didn't seem to have any love for at all. You know, they wiped out the Pakistani school in Mazar Sharif, killed like 600. And then two weeks later, we had the Fortress Uprising at Kalajungi, 500 foreign Taliban. It was pretty brutal. And I talked to a lot of Northern Alliance during the battles, you know, like it was a three-day battle, and, you know, between volleys, and you're just going, well, are you going to try to take prisoners at all? And they're like, nope, not interested. You know, we're going to kill as many as we can here. So, anyway. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I heard General Franks address that, actually, or talk about that. Uh, you know, believing that the 120 millimeter mortar system was the right weapon for the altitude and for the, the being maneuverable. Um, I don't know. I've heard soldiers talk both ways about it, like some wish they had it in the valley. I don't I don't know personally if it would have helped on D-Day. You know, just to, just, just to go right with an ex- you know, example, you had a couple hundred yards between Taliban positions and U.S. positions. 
and a lot of ridge lines here in between. I don't know. I don't know if artillery would have worked there. I don't know. They, a lot of soldiers complain that they didn't have artillery. They wanted artillery. I'm just not sure what they would have hit, what what they would have done with it. They didn't, I mean, they didn't even have deployed. They didn't. It wasn't deployed, right? Which is the mystifying thing about the U.S. I mean, the coalition forces in Afghanistan. Like I mentioned earlier, they only had 4,000 combat-ready troops. You know, they maybe had 20,000 in country, but that's the pul- the multinational peacekeeping forces in Kabul. And that's all they're doing. They're not doing. You know, and then you have. Um, and this whole war, I mean, is 80%, 90% fought by special forces. And so it's so, so much of it is just hidden, you know, but as far as, there's just not that, there's not that many combat assets there. There's a lot of air power assets in the region. But that's, inter- you know, it's interesting, you know. On one hand, you say, why so few troops? And on the other hand, you say, well, you did topple the Taliban in whatever, however many weeks it took. But people, I think, I need to remember that the Taliban was the battle or the war to get to the war. Had the Taliban handed over bin Laden and those guys, we wouldn't have gone to war in Afghanistan. I don't see there any indications we would have. We've, we've tolerated the Taliban for as long, you know, up till, up till last, that last fall. There's no reason for me to believe we would have gone to war with the Taliban if they would have turned that over. Maybe they had no choice, but it's another story. But the war, it's easy to say, oh yeah, it's over, we, we did. And we did a... You know, it is a restructuring time for Afghanistan, so maybe that is one war, but it wasn't the war that we ostensibly went there to fight. But that's all we've really been able to fight. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. They did. They all like the AC-130. That's the one thing. That's the one universal. Any more questions? Just you guys. Oh. All right. Go ahead, we'll do two, two quickies. Okay. Uh, do you have a count for Americans lost in the war? In the war? Yeah, you know, I heard the other day, and I think it was like 39. I think it's like it's still below 50 as far as I know. And most of them were killed in training. I mean, not training, but uh, accidents. As far as I know, there's been like, see, there's eight killed in Anaconda, the CIA at Kalajungi. There was another special forces killed on a patrol. I think most, I think still less than half of those are actually KIA killed in action. Yeah. I'm sure it does. And I'm sure it would. Well, I mean, look how impressed the Russians were at the end of the Gulf War. They panicked and they started design, redesigning their main battle tanks because we just popped them like tin cans in 91. And they freaked, you know, like, oh, that's oops, you know. So I would imagine that they certainly are. On the other hand, I think it's really interesting because we are now, again, studying, I, you know, go to Fort Leavenworth or you go to SWIC or some of the, you know, the colleges around, and they are looking at Chechnya over and over and over because I think they're looking at Iraq thinking, urban conflict, you want to go in and get Saddam, you got to go to Tikrit or whatever, and then, to, you know, or wherever. But you can't do it like the Russians because the first war, they used no dismounted infantry, which basically meant they stayed in their vehicle. The Chechens hit the vehicle in front with an RPG, they hit the vehicle in the back, they pin them all in. As they spill out, they engage on them with machetes in the beginning and just hack them to pieces. And then they got their weapons. They got a little more, a little more, a little more. And they killed, what, 3,000 in like 48-hour period in the city streets of Grozny in New Year's Eve 1994. I didn't even believe it. I thought it had to be some sort of conspiracy thing. I there's no way the Russians could get beat like that. They just disappeared. The Mycot Brigade went in with like a little under 2,000 men and came back with 16. That's it. So now the second time around, they go into Grozny, but they basically are like, we take fire from any square block, we eliminate the square block. Well, the Russians can fight that way. The U.S., we can't do that. We can't level block after block of Baghdad or Secret or those places. I mean, international opinion is not even with the U.S. on this adventure anyway. We can't just have a tremendous amount of civilian casualties. We can't inflict civilian casualties at that pace. So... It's going to be really interesting to see what we do if we're going to get involved and if we let them, if we let ourselves or the U.S. get sucked into street battles, well, how we're going to fight them. The Marine Corps, everybody's training right now. Everybody's looking at the urban warfare plans to see how they're going to do it if they have to go in and do it. <laughs> oh, I, okay. I, do we have time? Okay, thanks. Thank you, guys.